Thank you very much to everybody and thanks for inviting me here. I should do something that I don't know to show you to you my presentation, but I'm trying to probably she didn't do the end. Okay. I must look for my name and surname. That sometimes I even forget. Okay. <laughs> Is it time for utilities in 2027? Uh, before we have heard a nice speech, my congratulations for your speech, regarding the powerful innovation and how so magic is innovation that gives us a lot of opportunities. Unfortunately, like in Star Wars, do you remember Star Wars? Innovation is a big force, but there is always the dark side of the force. <laughs> no? So do you remember names like uh, Nokia? It was worldwide leader. Who had a Nokia before? Please raise the hand. Look around. Worldwide leader, competitor, 70% of global market share. Closed the company. So who used before a Polaroid? Who had a Polaroid? Worldwide leader. Unfortunately, closed the company. And uh, who used the Kodak? Kodak Films. Hey, we were in love for that, you know? And <laughs> for, that for that companies. Unfortunately, they didn't exist anymore. And uh, who used uh, Blockbuster? Raise the hand. Okay. So, the worldwide leaders, the global champions in their markets, they didn't imagine that in two, three, four years, they could pass from the glory to the death. This is innovation, the dark side of innovation. It can cancel entire sectors, unfortunately. And uh, uh, it can unveil great opportunities. So let's try to discuss about the future of utilities in 2027. Will we have utilities in 2027? Will we have energy companies? Will we have the same value chain that today we have? I'm not sure about it. And I would like to discuss with you because I have not the truth. No? What I have understood working on innovation more or less 20 years is that uh, we cannot say what will, be, what will happen in the next three years. And, uh, what I have learned is that when we think that something will happen in 10 years, always it will happen in two years. This is the problem in the last 20 years. The companies said, okay, no, no, the electric car, they will happen, but we have time. Yesterday, the global CEO of uh, Fiat Chrysler said, no, no, electric cars will happen, but in 20 years. So according to my experience in the last 20 years working on innovation in different sectors, when ma big managers said it will happen in 20 years, it happened in two, three years. And unfortunately for them, their company had big problems. Uh, I was working on an alliance between a big company, Nokia, and a very, very small company, very close to Dai. This small company offered to Nokia a great opportunity. Why don't you substitute your old Symbian software with my software? We have created a new platform called iOS that could be useful for you. This small company was Apple, very close to Dai at that time. And uh, the Nokia manager said, what can we do with this corporate zombie? It's a company that is starving. It's very close to die. We don't want to do anything with them. We are Nokia. We are the leader. We are the best one with the best design, with the most uh, advanced sales force, with the best logistics in the world, and with the, uh, a, a lot of a mi billions of people loving us. We don't need no, uh, Apple. And the Apple manager, Offer to them, hey, we will not enter in your sector for 20 years. But please adopt my operating system. 
you, do the, you produce the hardware, we produce the software. And uh, I was very close to finalize this agreement. And unfortunately, the CEO of Nokia said this expression, what can we do with this corporate zombie that we can't do by ourselves? Now, this is the paradigm of companies. We have the best people, we don't need other ones. And this is the paradigm of closed innovation. What we are trying to do is the opposite. To collaborate with everybody, including competitors, trying to change the world before that the change of the world will kill us. And uh, what happened? Happened that uh, Apple was refused by Nokia, and uh, they had to enter in this sector with a, a, a product that was called iPhone that has disrupted and killed Nokia. Even if, do you know who invented the first touchscreen? Was Nokia. The technology of the touchscreen was of Nokia. But this technology has been killed, uh, has killed Nokia because they didn't want to work with a small company. Another lesson, how are you working with, really working with startups? How are you able to integrate startups working with you in everyday activities? Not joking, playing with startups, buying some shares and showing in the public speeches, hey, we have them. No, no, deciding to give the power to startups instead of you. Huh? How are you organized to manage the activities with them, because they can be the next, no the next Apple. Saying to you, hey, why don't we collaborate? And you say, we are the big company, we don't need them. And after three years, the risk is that your company goes to bankrupt and that they will get the value. This is what I have seen in many sectors. And uh, unfortunately, when, uh, when people come, uh, they are, how could I say, they are not confident regarding the dark side of innovation. They said the internet will catastrophe collapse. There is no reason anyone would, would, would want a computer. No, I don't believe that motor cars could substitute horses. And these are certainties, these are paradigms, because people live with paradigms. And uh, the centralized power system is only a flash of pen. I'm getting some quotes just to sh be, sh uh, be shared with you that demonstrate that we live and we think according to our paradigms. And we think that our paradigms are correct because they are in our mind and we don't want to discuss, to, 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 to um, uh, how could I say, destroy them because they create our world. Our world is understood thanks to the paradigms that we have in mind. We are going to make a joke all together. <laughs> the problem is that uh, I will demonstrate to you that a seven years old kid can think better than us. I'm going to do this. Please make, it, make the game all together. Let's make a sum. Please say loud in your mother tongue or in English as you prefer this simple sum. It's a sum, not a very difficult mathematics uh, game. What's, what is the total? Please say loud. No, no, please say again. 1040, right. What is the total now? 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 Great. I've heard the majority of you saying 5,000. I said 5,000 when I seen this. Please raise the hand who said 5,000. Don't do like strange love, okay? <laughs> do this clearly, no, not, not, not this. No, see, no, not, okay, uh, this, okay, please do this. Okay, I said 5,000, huh? don't be shy. The most talented people with the, more, the most flexible brains, they go very fast, and they say 5,000. So if you said 5,000, 
you have a flexible mind, and you are able to learn very fast the rules. What is the dominant rule of this uh, simple sum? The dominant rule is add 1,000. I've asked your brain to add 1,000. And your brain failed at the end because you have added 1,000 even if you didn't have to add 1,000. Because the, tot the, re the total result, the total uh, um, is 4,100. 40, 30, 20, 10 is 100. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4,100. So the right answer is 4,100. But the majority of you said 5,000. If I ask a six years old guy to make the simple sum, he takes more time than you, and he says 4,100. So I canceled 30 years of mathematics that you studied, more or less, in 10 seconds. So how could it possible that this stupid guy with a fat stomach comes from Italy without a jacket and is able to cancel my brain? I have studied engineering, I took a PhD, and this guy is able in 10 seconds to cancel my math skills. No? I think that you are a little bit surprised. But I didn't cancel anything. I used the trap of your mind. Because if I ask you, to learn a rule, you apply the rule, even if you, must, you mustn't apply this rule. If in 10 seconds I can cancel 30 years of mathematics, more or less, imagine, try to imagine how can 10 years, 20 years in this sector of your experience, how can 20 years of rules of how your, your sector must be managed how can 20 years of rule can limit your brain? You know how to manage this sector. You know how to do. You know what you can't do. You know what you can't do. And your brain will never think in terms of, I can do it. This is a great problem. More you are skilled, more you are professional, more better you know this sector, and more you are limited. A seven years old, guy, he doesn't know, he's not able to learn very fast, and he doesn't make the mistake. You learn very fast, and if in 10 seconds you can cancel 30 years of mathematics, in 20 years of energy sector, probably you are much more limited than ignorant people outside of this sector. Who know the technology, who know the digital ecosystem, but who don't know anything regarding energy. They can say a lot of stupid things but they can come in the sector and break all the rules, cancelling the value chain. This is the problem. It happened in many sectors. People didn't know that uh, there are some rules regarding the hotels. They invented Airbnb, and in two years, Airbnb has, is more, uh, uh, more diffused, with more rooms, with a bigger value than Hilton Hotel without any investment. So you thought that I have big investment, I have big networks, my position is dominant, I can defend myself. Unfortunately, the risk is that it, no, it will not be as you think, as we think. Two paradigms that we have, we need grids, the storage is never enough to support a big company. If you have a, a, a factory, and if you have not any energy connection, how can you survive with storage? 10 seconds? Not more. These are two paradigms in our minds. We need grids, the storage is not enough. Let's keep on aside, and let's try to think about how the energy sector has developed itself. It started from big factories. In, the, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, sorry, we had big factories. Around these factories, we had some houses, the houses of the owners, of the boss of this factory, and we had the, pr the ability to produce energy around this factory, because the energy had to support the factories. This started in this way. This, so the paradigm is 
we need energy to support the factories. And we had the centralized, that you know, distribution. And now we are saying about a decentralized power system. But there are at least four forces that are killing our paradigms. The first one is new technology trends. This is very well known. The amount of solar and wind is expected to go to 46% by 2040. According to me, this will happen to 2030. Because all the, all the, the, for, all the uh, uh, attempts to foresee the world are always, unfortunately, wrong. The cost of, I, uh, of the batteries, the lie-ion batteries, will fail dramatically, no? And uh, from 600 to 73, but according to my opinion, this is wrong. Why? Because we will have new ways to produce batteries with new technologies that will disrupt even this cost. So I think that we will not have 73 uh, dollars per kilowatt, but the risk is that we will have seven, not 73, because this is based on this technology. But when you think about the technology, and all the world is investing on storage, they will find a new technology. And uh, small scales, uh, solar batteries and demo response can contribute to decentralize everything, not only the generation, the production of energy. How do you stabilize the grid now? You turn on a plant. When the TSO asks you for energy, you provide energy. You can't absorb energy. When there is too much energy in the grid, because all the solar systems are producing energy and the wind systems are producing energy, you cannot absorb. With batteries, you will be able to have a bi-directional stabilization. That is a new service. Who can provide it? Batteries. Who has the batteries? Who has the batteries today? The utility companies? No. I will demonstrate to you. So who will man manage the stabilization of the grids? You? No the owners of batteries. Now the batteries are in hospitals, are in supermarkets, are in telco networks. So a company like Vodafone can become a company that is able to stabilize the grid better than you. How much time do you take to stabilize a grid, turning on a plant? From seven minutes to 48 hours, if you use a coal plant. How much time can take Vodafone to stabilize the grid using 500,000 batteries that they already have? One second. You are not competitive if you compare yourself with Vodafone on the grid stabilization. Could you imagine? Today, not in the future, today, you are not competitive if compare your performance with the Vodafone one. And. Uh, I don't want to have you said, but uh, <laughs> the lady before said that innovation is great. I imagine, I love innovation. But look at the batteries today, not in the future. The BTS are the network of the mobile operators. Today, they have already installed 13 gigawatts in 14 different countries in Europe already batteries installed and running. Do you know how many minutes do they use them in a year, more or less? 12 minutes, 20 maximum in a year. They have batteries in, the grid, in, the ne in their networks. They don't use them. And they can use them to stabilize the grids with better performance than yours. And uh, we have many batteries in stores, in hospitals, in hotels, in data centers. Google has big data centers. Amazon has big data centers. And they have big batteries. They need those batteries. 
but they could use the 5%, the 10% of their batteries to stabilize the grids. If, people, if we will have a decentralized production of energy with a lot of photovoltaic plants all around the world, we will have storage with those plants. And the storage cost will be seven, ten dollars per kilowatt, as we said before. So they can buy one megawatt with a very affordable price. One megawatt of gigawatt. If you aggregate thousands of them, why don't why don't uh, um, you why the the world will need your plants to stabilize the grids? Probably the world will not need your plants, because your plants are not so efficient as the batteries are. They take too, too much time and they are not able to absorb energy. The battery is quite better than a plant to stabilize the grid. How much revenues do you do? How much margins do you do every year stabil stabilizing the grids? Forget them. This is the problem. And so, uh, where is this slide? I don't know why. I cannot sh I cannot see a slide. Oh, no, okay, okay. How everyone sees an electric vehicle? For you, this is an electric vehicle, is it? Okay, this is an electric vehicle. For us, this is an electric vehicle. This is an electric vehicle. You look at an electric vehicle as a car. We look at an electric vehicle as a battery with wheels. How many hours do you use an ele your, electric, your vehicle? Please, lady, how many hours a day do you use your vehicle? You, you. One hour. Me too. Uh, more or less people use the vehicle from one hour to two hours a day. The other 22 hours, it's a battery. Why don't we use this battery to stabilize the grid? Try to imagine billions of batteries all around the world with electric grids and with electric cars, 22 hours a day available. You can plug in them and we can use those batteries to stabilize the grids. This is what we are already doing in Denmark, in Germany, in uh, UK, and we are going to start in France, using electric cars. There are cars all around us, but for 22 years a day, to 22 hours a day, we don't use them. You go to the office, you park the car, and you forget it. And after you come back, you go home, and you park the car, and you get the car the day after. When you park the car, if you plug in this car, this is a connected battery connected to the grid. I can aggregate all of them, stabilizing the grid using the 10% of the battery, doing microcharging activity and micro discharging activity that doesn't affect the, the lifetime of the battery. It has been already demonstrated with many studies. And uh, so, can Nissan become a competitor of yours? Yes. They already have an energy services company. Can uh, a tractor company or can an agriculture company become a competitor of yours? Do you know that the tractors, for three, four months, they are not used? So try to imagine aggregated thousands, millions of tractors all around the world with electric batteries. They are batteries and they can stabilize the grid. So, why should you pay for your electricity? If I give you, if I ask you, hey, please, you invest in your electric car, you, I don't invest, I use your battery, I stabilize the grid, I give the energy for free. For you, as customer, it's easy. When you don't use the car, you plug in, you park and plug in, and you get the energy for free. This is the simple proposition. This is what we are doing in Denmark. It's for you, it's free. Please allow me to use your battery. What, what should I do here? I, I'm a customer, what should I do? Nothing. You just plug in and forget everything. I manage the business. 
I get more or less 1,500 euros a year per car. 1,500 euros. This is not the experimentation. We are doing this as a commercial business in Denmark. And we are getting these revenues, invoicing. 1,500, thanks to the Danish TSO that was so innovative that wanted to start with this innovative new business model. And uh, we did this not only thanks to us. The best people don't work only for you. As Professor Henry Chesbro, the inventor of Open Innovation, always said, you must look for people outside. And we have involved a big company like Nissan because we needed electric vehicles that could be eligible for this new business model. And we have found a, a small startup able to aggregate those vehicles. This, in this case, is Nuvi from San Diego. And uh, we had to invent an infrastructure able to charge the car, this is the paradigm, and discharge the car. What is the paradigm? The infrastructure must charge the car. What is the opposite? Infrastructure can discharge the car. People from the energy sector couldn't imagine that I had to discharge it. People from car industry, yes, they could imagine. That's why you had to contaminate your people with people from the arts, people from other sectors. I work in cartoon networks in France, and I have learned a lot for energy from people from cartoon networks. And I work with people from the pharma industry, AbV, Roche, Bayer, and I have I've learned a lot from them that I used with a big bank that was a customer of mine before. So contaminating the brain is needed. If you close the boundaries of your company and you don't pursue open innovation, involving people from other sectors, the risk is that you are killed by yourself, by your knowledge, by your limits, by your paradigms. That's why you need to open your company. Not because it's, and as the, 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 the previous speaker was saying, doing good is making business. Uh, we should have a, just a small video. Energy is part of our everyday life. We can't live without it. Do you know how you can help find new ways of managing energy in your country? By taking part in an innovative project by Enel and Nissan, you can help to transform the way we use energy. Enel and Nissan have worked with Nuve to make electric vehicles an integral part of the grid. With vehicle-to-grid or V2G technology, you can charge up your vehicle at night, drive it to work in the morning, and then charge the energy back into the grid when you park. When your car is connected to a V2G point, it becomes part of the city's electric grid. It is as though your car were a power plant, and you get paid every time the system operator uses energy from your car. In other words, the longer your electric vehicle is connected to the V2G point, the more energy you inject into the grid, and the more income you can potentially obtain. Discover V2G technology by Enel to find out how you can change the way you use energy and become part of the sharing economy. Use vehicle-to-grid technology and join the effort to make more efficient and sustainable use of energy. More batteries we will have, more we will be able to dispatch the renewables into the grid. So we need batteries to dispatch renewables, and we need renewables to better this world, to avoid pollution and greenhouse gases emissions. And that's why we are so committed on these topics. And if we don't do this, the car makers will do, alone. They will provide energy services, killing us. This is the problem. We cannot avoid to say, hey, innovation will come in the next 20 years, as Yesterday, the CEO of Fiat Chrysler said, unfortunately, the innovation is like the wind. You can put your hands in your face, covering your face, saying, that is not wind. You don't perceive it. That is not wind for you. But the wind comes, and it goes away, and you remain behind, left alone, and the other ones go with the wind. And, in, and they could even enjoy having a surf and surfing with this wind. 
instead of putting the, the hands in the, in the front of their face. So this sector, as you know it, could die. Generation will be done by single companies, single people with renewables. So not generation. And uh, unfortunately, distribution could be decentralized. So no distribution. Retail, how can you sell energy to people if they are able to produce their energy and to exchange their energy with peers to peers? So no retail. So <laughs> only transmission will survive. It can be. It can be. But cool transmission becomes useless. This is the strongest paradigm that we have in our heart. It's impossible. But could, be, could this be the next step ahead? Having single devices and single houses totally autonomous. If this happens, if the capacity of batteries will increase a lot, if the capacity, the ability of renewables to generate energy will increase a lot, why should we have a transmission network? It's useless. So, uh, in, 15th, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, even the CEO of IBM thought that the maximum space in the world was for five computers in the world. Five computers. Unfortunately for him, uh, we have computers all around us. You have a smartphone, this is a big computer, even if it's so small. The first computer that they have used to launch the man uh, in the space, uh, in the, on, on the moon, to, to, to support you know, the, the man on the moon was so big as this room. Now there is more, cap more capacity and uh, a faster capacity in your mobile phone that is so little. So what is the evolution of storage? What is the evolution of the ability of the single devices to produce energy and to store it? So will we use transmission? I'm not sure. And <laughs> going back to our paradigms, are we sure that we need an electrified area with grids? I don't have any answer. I don't say yes, I don't say no. But I have the doubt. Before then Cartesio, there was a, a saint, a philosopher, Saint Ag Augustine. He said, I doubt, that's why I'm sure that I exist. So the basic of being comes from the having doubts. In this sector, I have worked in more or less 30 different sectors. This is the sector in which I've seen, I've heard top managers having a lot of certainties. This is the difference between uh, among this sector and many other ones that I've seen. In the banking industry, it happened 20 years ago. They had a lot of certainties. Now they have a lot of pain. <laughs> no? And uh, what I have seen is that this is the sector in which the top managers have more certainties. And they say it's impossible. But it always seems impossible until it's done. So just the last slide and thanks for listening to me. Uh, will it time for utilities? I think that if we are not innovation, we are not party. So let's try to have a smile and let's try to rethink ourselves with the big willingness to have parties to survive. That's why we have linked innovation and sustainability. And my role is allowing Hanel to survive. That's why I manage innovation. You can't be sustainable if you don't innovate. That's why sustainability and innovation are in a unique function. I am directly uh, under the CEO, and I have the same relevant role that the CFO has in our company. The CFO is managing existing money, but without innovation, there will be not any money that the CFO will manage. This is the problem. So probably the innovation manager is more important than the CFO. Okay? So, 
And on the other side, if you want to involve people who are outside your company, the best minds, the talented ones, the rebels, they don't work with companies who are not sustainable. They want to work to leave something of them to the future generations. They want to give a sign to the humanity of their presence. To involve those guys, they don't work for money. I'm sorry. They, don't, they are not involved by MBOs. They're involved by big challenges. So if you want to involve them, you must be sustainable. You must respect the world, try to better this world, and try to adopt big challenges, because on big challenges, you get the best, the most talented ones. That's why we want to marry, and we have married, innovation and sustainability to create a better world. Thanks a lot for your attention.